Some of you have asked how two grease monkeys went from hitting things with hammers to creating a completely custom instrument cluster and its associated electronics. Well, therein lies a tale. It all started with this, the control box for the solder 3D printer. We needed a way of controlling the hot end and the bed temperature, but we also needed to be able to display that data so we could make the process as repeatable as possible. Nick had been banging on about Arduinos for yonks, but we'd never actually played with them, favouring our usual brute force and ignorance approach. This appeared to be the perfect opportunity to get familiar with something that had been interesting us for a while. Like any new technology, our first efforts to control it were tentative and clumsy. So inept were we that it was worth us setting up an Amazon subscribe and save scheme to keep us in development boards. The sheer volume of help and advice available for the Arduino community is astonishing and relatively quickly we got the control box sorted. It might look complex inside, but it's not really. It starts with the Arduino. This is obviously the heart of the project. In our case, the power comes from this adjustable buck converter, but they can use a 9 volt battery or even USB power depending on what you're doing. If you connect a potentiometer like this one to one of the Arduino's analog inputs, its 5 volt output and its ground, the Arduino reads the return voltage and converts that value via its 8-bit analog to digital converter, or ADC, into one of a possible 256 values. That's the input control. The output is handled in our case by this PWM MOSFET controller. What is PWM, I hear you ask? Well. I wondered too. Turns out it's dead straightforward. Pulse width modulation, or PWM, is just a technique to control power by varying the width of pulses in a periodic signal, while keeping the frequency constant. It doesn't vary the voltage at all, it just varies the amount of time it's on. That time is known as a duty cycle, and it's normally expressed as a percentage. Remember those 256 possible values I mentioned just now? Well, those are used to determine the duty cycle. If the value is zero, it's 0% zero duty cycle, so no power. If the value is 255, then it's 100% duty cycle and flat out. Values in between are proportioned accordingly. It's that easy. So the heater cartridge is hooked up to the PWM MOSFET controller and the potentiometer we attached first controls the duty cycle and therefore the heat. The temperature is measured by this thermistor, which is just another type of variable resistor, just like the potentiometer, and is read by one of the Arduino's analog inputs, and via some clever maths, comes up with a temperature. That temperature is displayed on the little TFT screen, and the coding for that came from some helpful tutorials tweaked for our own use. And essentially that's all there is to it. Double up the heating hardware for the bed and you've got yourself a complete system like ours for a total hardware cost of less than 30 quid. The code to run it consists of about 130 lines, so it's not heinous, and as I say, the help out there on the interwebs is fantastic. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I'm living proof that if an aged numpty like me can do it, there'd be no stopping you. So how did the backlighting come about? Well, you see, once you get a taste of what's achievable, the possibilities become endless. All we really wanted, to start with, was a way of controlling the brightness of our chosen LEDs, but without the need for a remote control or an app on our phone. There's nothing better than a good button. Nick had created a mechanical way of achieving that using an array of different preset controllers switched by relays. He built it, and it did actually work, of a fashion, but, thought I, wouldn't it be significantly more flexible, more compact and more sensible to use an Arduino to control the LEDs? After all, there's a whole library set up to do exactly that. So I got down to work experimenting, adding functions with the ever-moving goalposts, adding I2C communication and so forth, until the lighting system worked well. The LEDs need 5 volt power, so we converted the car's 12 volt down to 5 with this linear voltage regulator. They can create a lot of heat, so instead of fitting a massive heat sink, we eventually swapped them for the switching type instead. Much better. The digital inputs on the Arduino used for switching signals also require no more than 5 volt, and not the 12 volt from the car. Ask me how I know. Those don't require much current at all, and therefore a much smaller component is used. 
Here's a washer for scale. We actually went even smaller on the final build. I think we inhaled more of these 78L05s than we mounted on the board. Talking of smaller things, the Arduino Nano does everything the much larger Uno does, only in a more compact and bijou package. Ideal for mounting to a daughter board, complete with all the pull-down resistors. Wait, I hear you cry. What is a pull-down resistor? Frankly, I didn't know either, and, and again, it's really quite simple. Digital inputs on microprocessors do not like a floating state. They like to be either high or low. In this example, when the switch is pressed, 5 volt flows into the pin and the Arduino recognises that as high. When the button is released, if there's a pull-down resistor installed like this one here, the resistor pulls the input pin to ground, making that signal now low. Think of it as a return spring. It lets the signal change to high if it's forced to by enough voltage, but otherwise it takes over and returns the input to ground or low. With a pull-up resistor, the switch and the resistor have just swapped places. So when the button is pushed, the Arduino gets a low signal. And for the most part, that's all there is to it. For our bench testing, we made a stand-in control box that mimics the inputs from the car. For example, there's a switch that represents the lights being turned on. There's a momentary toggle switch to scroll through the brightness levels. And there's potentiometers standing in for the fuel level and water temperature senders. Talking of the fuel and temperature, how did we get the Arduino and servos to work with the car's hardware? Well, yet again, it was fairly simple. What you need is a voltage divider circuit made up of a fixed resistor of an appropriate value, a variable resistor like a fuel level sender or a water temperature sender because that's all they are, and power and ground set up like this. That's the fixed resistor, that's the variable one, and at the junction of the two, that's the signal that goes to an analog input on the Arduino. The Arduino reads that voltage, converts it to a digital value, maps it to a servo angle, say 0 to a 180, then generates a PWM pulse of the correct width, which the servo uses to set its position. It's quite simple and bloody clever all at the same time. We've also added some code to switch on the warning light when the servo reaches a certain position when it's out of fuel or boiling its tits off. But Richard, how, I hear you yell, do you get the servos to park when you turn the ignition off? Because you're cutting the power to everything. Well, that's a good question. When the ignition goes off, the power to the Arduino goes off, as does the power to the voltage dividers and the servos. To start with, the needles stayed resolutely where they were last told to go. This wasn't good enough for Nick, so I came up with a delay system using a different power source the permanent live to the immobilizer light. It works like this. The Arduino monitors the ignition via a digital input pin. This one actually, D7. And when it senses that the ignition has been switched off, it immediately sends a five volt output to an optocoupler, tells the servers to go to a predetermined park position and starts a two second timer. This optocoupler is hooked up to the permanent live and when activated, the Arduino and the servos are powered. There's a moment when the board is unpowered, but a couple of capacitors bridge that tiny gap. The servos park, the two second timer runs out, and the five volt power to the optocoupler stops. This kills the Arduino. Simple, but effective. A problem we encountered that took some sorting out was this. The servos would glitch like mad when the lights were on. After much gnashing of teeth, I decided in the end to split the functions over two stacked Arduinos, one for the servos, and one for the lights. Nick made a new daughter board, and they share only power, ground, and the D7 ignition monitor pins. Everything else is separated. The single Arduino was having a hard time dealing with I2C communication, multiple PWM outputs, and more besides. Since the amicable split, the servos have been rock solid. You might have noticed the soft start lights there. When you've got some headroom, you can play with cool ideas like that. So what else have we learned? Well, if we were making it again, it would be totally different. Every input into the Arduino from the car would be switched low via an optocoupler. We didn't know about isolating the inputs until it was too late and we'd printed the board and blown up a dozen Arduinos. Switch low, kids. Trust me. We've learned that the chances are, yes, that's possible. The amount of times Nick's gone, can we just, and I've said, yeah, I reckon, 
and we found a way to do it, whether it's red needles or sweeping the servos to match the rev counter and speedo at startup, or separating the switch panel backlighting so we can balance the brightness better, it's all just possible. With this coding, or sketches as they like to call it, AI is your friend. We were lucky enough to have one of our patrons, Ian, help us out initially, and that got us going hugely. But as time wore on and my programming skills got better, so did ChatGPT and Claude and Grok. If you can explain what you want, AI will provide the code. It's incredible, and it opens it up to absolutely everyone. Most of all, though, we learned to embrace it, to try it, to fail, to blow stuff up, to adapt and to overcome. Your imagination is the limit, and we've seen stuff on the Mini that we'd love to reimagine using our newfound knowledge. But that's for a whole other time. Thanks for watching.